Well, welcome Humber Arborist of the year 2020. Obviously we're meeting in different circumstances with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, we're gonna do our best to demonstrate a crane assisted tree removal and go through the processes and the sequences of work uh, that allow for a successful uh, crane job. So every good successful crane job starts with good job planning. As the quoter, estimator, or job organizer, you need to ensure that you have space for a large piece of equipment like a crane to operate. Uh, it needs to have outrigger clearance and boom clearance uh, to work safely. Um, you need to look out for things like hydro and adjacent trees, adjacent structures, wires, all those sorts of things. So we're gonna do a bit of a, a pre-work assessment here. Uh, here we have the tree that we're gonna be taking down. It's a dead sugar maple. Uh, there's a few canopy picks that we can make and um, a couple of trunk picks that we can demonstrate some various cutting techniques and really slow it down and hopefully get some good video uh, and audio on how to do uh, make these cuts and, and lifts properly. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have fancy recording gear. We just basically have an iPhone and a GoPro. So we're gonna do our best. I'm gonna talk as loud as I can and make sure that uh, everything's clear and concise. So in terms of this job site, uh, we're working off the road so we don't need uh, traffic control. Uh, there's no hydro involved, which is nice. Uh, if there is hydro involved and you're working in proximity, you need to make sure that you have, first of all, somebody who's qualified to work around hydro. Uh, if you're gonna be coming within those limits of approach, uh, you need to consider an isolation, okay? Just shut the power off so that you can work safely. Cranes are not, they do not have isolated, uh, insulated booms. So you need to make sure that you're maintaining that 10 feet of distance at all times with the crane and the load on the crane. Uh, we're just gonna do some uh, setup here so this crane is going to be set up exactly where it, where it stands outriggers will be coming out and uh, being placed on this on this area here which you can see is wet and not very compact so we need to make sure that we can spread the loads out that the outriggers are creating on the ground on the ground pressure so once we do our setup uh, we'll take some video of that and make sure that uh, our ground stability is good and that we have proper matting and cribbing in place uh, to work safely with this crane. So it starts with job planning. Okay, so we have clearance. There are some trees around this, uh, the tree. Uh, however, the boom is, is tall enough and, and high enough where we can elevate the lift and, and work around those trees. So we're gonna get started setting up this crane and uh, we'll go from there. done our pre-job assessment we've all signed off we've had we have a job plan in place uh, the crane is now set up as you can see and we're ready to proceed with accessing the tree and uh, commencing with this removal so this tree we feel is safe to climb Joel uh, has installed the climbing line we've load tested it and so in that sense, we're, we're good for tree access by climbing the tree, just a regular climbing uh, system. You know, he's gonna ascend SRS, and then most likely move uh, to MRS while he's up there. So let's talk about crane outrigger stability. Uh, as you can see over here, we had to deal with a bit of a slope. Crane out outriggers, you, you always want to be stable in a level position. Uh, if we hadn't put these pads here, it would be on an angle. And that would 
would not be sufficient or adequate for the outrigger stability. So what we've done is we've built up uh, the unlevel areas with some cribbing, some blocking. And we've implemented these track mats to help disperse the load and create a good solid, solid base for that outrigger. So if we move over to this outrigger, If we were to just put this outrigger down without any padding, without any track mats, it would most likely sink and it wouldn't be a stable ground. So you need to make sure that you have adequate ground bearing capacities. So in this case, we use track mats again and a large composite pad to help spread out those loads so that we can have adequate ground bearing capacities. So once your crane is set up, we know we have good boom clearance. We can elevate these picks above the rest of the canopy of the forest and bring them down to, to our drop zone. Now another thing we want to consider is communication. So right now, the tree's right beside the crane. We have, we have good visual. Uh, we could use hand signals, but the best form of communication is two-way radio. So we have these, um, these Peltor two-way radios. Um, other options are Bluetooth technology like Senna. Uh, you can use walkie-talkie, like a two-way radio walkie-talkie. But we find with uh, having the headset and the voice activation, uh, these these headsets are, are definitely a must with uh, crane-assisted tree removal. Uh, there are times where you come across blind lifts where uh, you can't always see the climber. Maybe he's on the other side of a house or a structure or, or uh, a tree that's in leaf, but we need to make sure we always have constant 100% clear communication uh, before starting this job. Another thing we want to consider is our lift sequence. So where are we starting in the tree? Uh, how big can we go? So that a lot of the times the drop zone will dictate how big, how large we can go with, with, certain, uh, with certain trees and setups. So we have the capacity to remove this whole tree if we want to, because we're right beside it. We have a lot of capacity in terms of the crane. Uh, however, we don't have the space at the drop zone to be able to handle that much material at once. So, and also we want to do some demonstrations on some smaller picks with, with uh, limbs and stuff. So we're going to be taking this in, in multiple uh, picks. We're going to be do, doing some canopy picks and then a few uh, wood, a few uh, good sized diameter wood picks. I'm just going to take a minute to talk about sling selection before we get started. Joel's just ascending up that tree right now. Um, so what we have here are two different types of slings which we typically use at Diamond. Um, these dead-eye rope slings which are becoming more popular in the industry for, for good reasons. You can tie them wherever you want. You can create half hitches and then with the tail tie it off with a bowline, clove hitch or a cow hitch. Um, they're easily adjustable, they're really long in length, they're colored differently in respect to the lengths that they have. So this blue one I believe is 30 feet and the, the two orange ones are around 25 feet. Uh, they're great for balancing wide canopy picks. Uh, this is our preferred choice. Uh, there's a few different manufacturers who make these. Uh, these are the Tuffelberger Chisholm slings. There's also the Ultra X rigging slings uh, made by a different manu manufacturer. Since we've been using these, they've been our favorite just for balancing uh, and, and, and rigging uh, can wide canopy picks. Uh, these other slings here are round bag slings, endless loop bag slings. Uh, very easy to use. It's an endless loop. Uh, they're durable. They have this outer sheath that protects the inner core, which has all the strength. Uh, easy to inspect. Uh, basically, if you see the core at all, it needs to be uh, discarded. Uh, so basically, you can girth, you can girth these around themselves, or you can utilize a clevis shackle on the end. Uh, you simply undo the clevis shackle. Uh, girth around an object and reattach it. Okay, just make sure the clevis shackle is oriented properly, uh, with no chance that this uh, can can untwist. But we also have these 
uh, hooks that can be utilized with the bag slings. Uh, however, these uh, do not have a rated uh, clip, so you need to make sure that these are oriented properly on the spine. These are very fast and efficient, uh, however, you just need to make sure that they get oriented properly. Joel, as he's uh, climbing throughout the tree and setting these slings, will make sure that there's a clear uh, video for instruction on how to properly, properly set those slings up. Uh, other than that, we're ready to go, and let's take this tree down. Who's control? No small talk here, baby. Let's just go. Let's go. Hey guys, so I've got our piece strapped up. I got three slings on it, as you can see. I believe it's gonna be fairly balanced. So my initial plan right now is I'm gonna make a V, what we call a V cut or a shelf cut. It all depends on which way you look at it, if it's sideways or if it's upright. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in this side first on the bottom side. I'm going to cut this way so it has something to sit on when it comes free. And then when I'm done that, I'm going to tell Cody, the operator, that I'm starting my second cut. And I'm going to come down on top so it kind of creates like a, like a shelf. And what that does is that it'll prevent the bottom, like the base, from falling down if it's too butt heavy. And uh, it kind of prevents it from getting pushed back into the tree. So I think it's fairly uh, balanced. I don't think it's gonna rotate much. So I'm, yeah, I'm gonna do a V cut. So a V cut or shelf cut is nice and controlled. And once it's cut and I know it's free, double check that it's free. And you can tell the operator to winch up as you're moving away to a safe place. Okay, so I'm comfortable here. I got two points of attachment. I'm gonna start with a cut here, and then a cut here. And my ropes aren't anywhere close to the uh, saw at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and get cutting. I'm double checking that it's free. Okay, Cody, you can winch up. over some ground worker safety rules um, that you should have in place. As the load's coming down, obviously you never want to stand directly under the load uh, at, any, at any point of time. Um, when we're dealing with trees, we have loose, loose branches, hangers that can easily break off. You know, for example, this one, you know, I just simply pulled that off. That could easily become dislodged at any point. So we never want to stand under the load. And once the load has been dropped by the chipper, either on the chipper bed or near the chipper, uh, the risk hasn't gone away. So we still have loads, tension, compression at various points um, that we need to look out for as the grounds person processing this debris. Uh, we can utilize the crane right now still. Uh, it's still tensioned on those two upper ones. This lower one has become slack. Okay, so we can we can cut these lower limbs off to make it easier for the ground person to lay down safely. Uh, you always want to keep an eye out for the headache ball. Uh, it, could, it could be under tension or swing, depending on how smooth the operator is. So just be aware of your co-workers 
and what's what's around you and the pressures and intentions involved with with uh, processing the debris on the ground all right so that pick was pretty smooth so now once uh, that pick is gone and it's over there by the chipper i'm waiting for the crane to come back so in this time i can be planning out my next move so my next my next pick is going to be this one here okay so i'm I'm sizing it up, I'm taking a look. It's pretty long, a couple dead limbs. It's not too wide. So I'm thinking I could put a strap there. Another one, maybe around there, just to kind of balance it out. And one down here to control the butt. All right, so I went ahead, I went with my plan that I said. I'm gonna put three slings on it, right? So I got the one up top, which is most of the weight. And I also got this lower one here, which is gonna control the butt. So it's dispersing the weight between the two slings. That third one that I put up there on the right, it's on a very small branch. It's not very critical for the, for the load. It's not holding a lot of weight. But I just put that third one on to keep it from rotating. Because if I just did these two, it would want to rotate this way. So I put that third one on just to, just to keep it from rotating. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to do a, a V cut or shelf cut. I'll go here and then cut down that way. We were going to do a lift cut which would consist of putting a notch in here and then doing a back cut, leaving a little bit of hinge wood, getting like myself getting out of the way and then letting Cody winch up and lift. But as you can see, we got another tree here which restricts us for lifting. So I had to put this third one on to keep it balanced and then Cody can winch out of the way. So, I'm, at, I'm, I'm here tying my third strap. One, two. I, I sloughed off all the bark here because uh, this bark could slide up and if there's no branches above it, it could just slide right off. So I, I pulled all the bark off, got it around some nice solid wood. Uh, it's something I just want to say here. I have this really long strap. If you're ever strapping something on and you're worried about the uh, integrity of this branch here, you think it's a weak branch, uh, you can bring the sling down, you can tie a half hitch right here, and then you can anchor it off to something a little bit lower, which is more solid wood. So that's what I'm going to do here. This branch is pretty dead. So I'm going to do a half hitch here because this is where I want the uh, strap placement. But I'm going to anchor it down somewhere lower. So now from the crane up there, the strap comes down. I put a half hitch and then I anchored it down to a thicker piece of wood. So here I am, I 
pulled my rope out of my tie-in and I'm lanyard it off here. It's a comfortable working position. I got my other rope, my climbing line, hooked up down here with my friction saver installed just in case I need to come down. So I got two points of attachments. So for this one, we're just going to do a V cut. So it's not going to be a shelf cut, it's going to be a V. So I, I think the tree is more likely to rock uh, this way instead of this way. So I'm going to place my V this way so that it can pivot with, within the V, if that makes sense. So I'm going to do my first cut on the back side here and come down. And my second cut's going to come right here. And I don't know where I'm going to go, but I don't care. I'm Once I get to this point, I got a little bit left. So I'm going to use the tip of the bar to cut really slowly. Well, that was pretty controlled. I had to, I had to duck a little bit, but because I'm in a safe working position, I was able just to lean back so that the piece was, would go right over me. But uh, that was still pretty smooth. So we took off all the canopy branches. Uh, I just dropped a bunch of lower ones, and now we're uh, we're onto a peg. So this is a nice straight peg, a little bit of a lean, but we swapped out our our slings. So now we don't have the rope slings; we have these bag slings. With the bag slings, you got two options: you can use a hook, I mean a uh, a clevis shackle, like so, or you can use a hook. thing with these, the gate's got to be facing down. When you girth it around the tree and you hook back on, that's how it needs to be loaded. It can't be like that because it has the potential for this to hit the gate and the gate is not rated. The hook is rated but the gate is not. Okay, so I'm going to strap this tree up. I'm going to use one hook and one clevis shackle and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so I got the shackle on. What I'm going to do now though is I'm going to flip it. Spin it around. The pin is facing down and this part is getting loaded. So before I head down to make my cut, I got about a couple, couple feet here so that I know that the, the slings are not going to slide up. The bark is all intact so I'm not too worried about that. I got some nice branch unions here that are going to keep the sling intact. Always check around the back side. Slings kind of go down here but that's okay because they're not going to be uh, expanding at all. This is going to grab it. So I'm pretty confident that the slings aren't going to go anywhere. All right, so that's good. So we got two slings strapped on either side of the tree. And we got nice long slings, so our angles are uh, very good, okay? So now I'm gonna make my way down. I'm gonna swap out for a bigger saw and we'll make a couple cuts. A couple things you wanna keep in mind. Uh, when, when doing crane work, it's not guesswork. You should always know where the, uh, the piece is going to shift, where it's going to swing. Um, but 95% of the time like you can, you can predict that kind of stuff. So I got my two slings more on this side of the tree. So the piece is actually going to tilt away from me, which is what I want. So I'm going to do a straight cut, straight cut this way. And I'm going to cut very slowly at the very end 
uh, so that if it does shift to position, I can I can watch it and, and make sure. Another thing is uh, I was climbing MRS. I, I came down to this spot, landed in, I pulled my ropes out. Now I'm switched over to uh, SRS, just with a choked beaner. I'm not climbing on this, but uh, it's just as a precaution in case I need to get down out of the tree fast. Um, in case I cut through this and it's hollow and there's a bee's nest inside. So uh, just got to be prepared and have an escape route. Imperfect, I'm imperfect. No road map, getting lost on purpose. Phone, no service, but it's clear out here. I'm living with nothing to fear out here. There's lessons you learn, bridges you burn. All for the cost of a dollar to earn. So I, I cut all the way through and I, I know that I have a strap left on the back side. I see it moving. So once I see that, I know that we're in control. Now I'm just going to nip away at the back side. So our prediction was right, it did tip away from us. So I cut I cut all the way through. I left a strap on this this side here. It tipped. And then we finished it by cutting very slowly. The smallest amount of wood fibers here can really shock load the crane. So when making cuts, really gotta be 100 110% sure that your piece is free. big V cut just to kind of show the pros and cons uh, cons definitely takes a lot longer to cut through that much wood and that much wood also the saw doesn't cut as well uh, you're kind of going with the grain this way whereas if you cut straight across you're going against the grain so when you're cutting on an angle your saw isn't really sharp it's gonna take you a lot longer. So, we did a big V. As you saw in the last video, it kind of tipped, but it stayed put. It didn't It didn't swing off and drop or fall away because the V, it kind of gets stuck in the V. So, uh, it's definitely a pro to using the V cut if you're beside a house or anything. Um, it's just really controlled definitely not the end-all be-all of all cuts you don't need to do it on every single cut it has its place um, it's just another tool to keep in the toolbox so uh, definitely making sure that you line your cuts up line your cut up as you can see here my cut wasn't exactly lined up but uh it broke free anyway, so it kind of worked to my advantage, which is good. Uh, it's good to have a communication with your operator at all times, what you think. Even if the piece is cut halfway through, just stop and let your operator know what's going on. 
Uh, tell him like, oh, my, my curve is opening, my curve is closing. Uh, you can, then he'll know either to winch up, winch down. So, uh, communication is just really key. And you're not screaming at him. I'm not screaming at Cody. Even though he's right there, I could. But I'm not screaming at him because we got these headsets on, so. All right, so in summary, um, we hope that you found this demonstration helpful. Um, we really want to focus on communication whenever we're working with cranes. It's important to always have 100% clear communication with the operator and making sure that you know before each lift, um, pretensions and uh, weight estimations are communicated properly, and that we uh, plan these jobs out properly. It's a simple process. You're transferring weight from the tree to the crane as gradually as possible. Uh, you want to take every precaution necessary to, to make that as smooth as possible. So by balancing, making certain cuts, uh, there's, there's various things, techniques you can, you can use uh, in this industry. Uh, one thing I want to just refocus on and reiterate is the fact that job site awareness, being aware of the ground workers, um, being, being aware of overhead loads at all times, being aware of what the operator has to deal with in terms of capacity and and uh, distance and height. Um, and always, always just thinking, thinking the next step, um, trying to predict what what's going to happen with these loads when they when they come free from the tree. Uh, this is uh, one resource of many. Um, uh, we hope you find it helpful, but there's many other resources you can find online. Uh, there's some good tree stuff videos on uh, crane assisted tree removal. Uh, the one manual I would suggest is the TCIA uh, crane used for arboriculture, the fourth edition. It's an excellent resource. It has everything um, to do with uh, using cranes in, uh, in tree assisted removal. So. Uh, other than that, I think. I'm done if Joel wants to mention anything else. Yeah, one thing that um, may not show in the videos is before we make a cut, we have the piece strapped. Um, I come down, we're about to make our cut. Me and Cody are always in constant communication on uh, which way we think it's going to go. I give my input and he gives his input. I like to ask Cody what he thinks the piece is going to weigh. He'll ask what I think it's going to weigh, and we kind of go around in that in that zone for capacity-wise, and just for uh, how the piece comes off off the uh, trunk. So if you have too much pressure, you are in uh, risk of shock load, and too little pressure, uh, it could start falling down and uh, barber chairing or reverse barber chairing. So having that consistent pressure on the piece is key. So yeah, just wanted to make sure that, like, make clear that that's what me and Cody are always talking about before we make a cut. And uh, yeah, just constant communication with the operator and the climber back and forth. So yeah, thanks for watching, and we hope this is helpful. We trust that uh, you've learned something uh, from our demonstration here. Uh, these are unfortunate times, but uh, this is what we have to do to uh, stop the spread of COVID. And uh, yeah. Well, have a good day and we'll see you later.